Good evening and welcome to Fish Hawk Live and the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast. Tonight, we're joined by professional photographer Matt Addington from Matt Addington Creative in Central Minnesota. Matt, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, I appreciate you having me on, Chris. Matt, before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and Matt Addington Creative? Well, yeah, it's uh, it's just a passion of mine, I guess, has been photography since I was a little kid and been really fortunate to work in the outdoors industry primarily. Now, um, full-time going on, oh, 12, 13, 14 years, I guess. Um, most of the work that I do is, is for... Um, you know, brands and companies in the fishing industry, obviously, uh, hunting, fishing, agriculture, outdoor lifestyle are probably the places that um, I'm hired the most to do the most work, uh, commercial, editorial, um, work for a lot of brands, obviously, in fishing, where we'll talk tonight. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm blessed that I, I get to do this and get paid and can make a living um, doing something that's one uh, photography that I love, but also you know being in the outdoors to to work. I, I catch myself the, the handful of times we've been together. Um, you know, you, you pinch yourself going, "Oh, that right, this is my job. I can't believe it." So, I uh, really, really lucky that way, and it's it's just been a great uh, lifestyle and a ton of fun, and just to be able to you know tell stories for companies and kind of understand. Um, the, the branding story that, that they have and who their customer is and what their company is all about. And then through photography and video, both, um, you know, be able to kind of stitch that all together to kind of help them tell that story. So pretty lucky that way. Matt, camera equipment has really gone kind of two ways of late. You've got the super high end stuff and that stuff is really incredible now what, what they're churning out. Um, but the other way that consumer driven equipment has gotten better and better and more and more affordable, what kind of trends are you seeing kind of on both ends of the spectrum there? Well, yeah, it's, it's hard to keep up. Um, honestly, you look at the, 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 the phones we're carrying around in our pocket, you know, the most valuable cameras anybody can have because you've got them, you've got them with you all the time, but you know, what they're able to do now you know, five years ago would have cost, you know, $10,000 if you look at the quality. Um, so all the way down on that end, all the way up to the to the highest end, um, these companies just keep pushing the envelope with with megapixels and, you know, focus tracking and, and video capabilities. Um, it, it is mind blowing. It's something that, um, you, you know, you can settle in and get comfortable with something, but um, you might as well kind of try to stay on the on the cutting edge and learning some of this stuff too. I, I probably will mention it again later, but you know, you can have all the greatest bodies in the world and the greatest focus tracking and the most megapixels and the highest resolution. Um, the, the, the glass that you're shooting through, the lenses you're shooting through is still, you know, like they have for a hundred years probably are still going to uh, make or break the quality of the image. So I, I do always stress that, but it's, it's uh, crazy how it's blown up and where it's gone and where it's going, who knows, but uh, it's kind of fun to try to ride the wave. Yeah, we got uh, some guys that are regulars on the show showing up tonight to watch. We got uh, Randy Beavis from Fort Peck, Montana. He sent us a picture of his salmon he caught today. So nice job getting out on the water there, Randy. And uh, Blind Osprey in the house as well, and he's a, a regular as well. Uh, Matt, tell us a little bit about uh, the equipment you shoot on. What kind of things are you using when you're doing your work? Yeah, I you know, um, probably three years ago now I switched over from – from your traditional DSLR to a mirrorless system. Um, I, shot a, I shot Sony for a little bit um, and then switched over to Fuji. Um, I think in the, in the photo that you had up there is kind of our, our lead in photo. I, had, I, had a, uh, I was shooting um, Fuji in that photo. Uh, still got some, some Fuji blood flowing through me, but through it all year um, from, from way back from when I had first started, I was a Canon guy. And so now um, primary body that I'm carrying around is the Canon R5, the EOS R5, which is, again, like we said, it's kind of mind blowing that you can have, you know, 45 plus megapixels in, in a mirrorless camera and it can shoot, you know, 8K log video. Um, it's, it's crazy. Their new, um, the new lineup of RF glass that Canon has come out with is as sharp as anything that I've ever shot. So that's super impressive. Um, you pay for all of that, but it's, um, you know, it's a tool. Um, I used to get really, really attached 
uh, I don't know if emotionally, but I got attached to my gear and it was my baby and it was this and that. And now I've realized, um, much like probably a lot of the guys that are coming on here with their fishing gear, it's tools um, and it's it's what you do to, to make your living. So um, I try to have, you know, the best stuff that I can and the best stuff I can afford <laughs> um, because like I said, it is spendy, but the uh, the EOS mirrorless system is, is fantastic. They've got new stuff coming out now that's going to be even better than what we're shooting now. So um, Canon's primarily where I'm at right now. Tell us a little bit, if someone is is kind of thinking about getting into doing some serious shooting and they're, and they're looking at, at buying something a little bit more high end, obviously they're not going to go all the way to the top, but something that would kind of get them on the path to getting there. What's some of the equipment that you would recommend for that? There's stuff that is so affordable. Um, you you don't have to spend, you know, four to $5,000 on a camera body and $3,000 on each piece of glass. Um, let, let's just talk Canon, for example. Um, I've made the recommendation to a number of people just coming in to, you know, getting serious, I guess, about taking better photos. Um, Canon's got an M series. Uh, I think it's an M50 is, is, a, is a body that's very affordable, probably in the $500 range. They don't have quite the lineup of lenses, but you can get, um, you know, Metabones, adapters that will adapt some of Canon's better glass to those. Um, you can pretty much take any any brand and you know mix and match with with adapters and stuff. So that Canon M series is a very, very affordable, um, high quality. It's got enough megapixels for you know 99% of the world is ever going to use. Um, the Fuji gear that I shot, um, even their their highest end mirrorless system, which is the XT4. Um, you can get into a, a body probably in the $1,200 range now, which seems very expensive. But if you're comparing it to the to the highest end stuff, it's it's not that bad. So some of these, um, you know, kits that you see at at Best Buy or places like that that um, offer a you know a camera and a lens and a, or a couple lenses for six, seven, eight hundred dollars, um, it's a great starting point. And then just kind of working to upgrade your lenses um, is really the the part that as you get serious about it, you you will learn that that's what's going to make or break your image. A uh, mutual friend of ours I was talking to today, John Marshall, he said that, that these things take pretty good photos. So uh, t tell us a little bit about these guys and, and shooting with this stuff. I, I hope that John doesn't think they take too good of pictures because I want him to still hire me to shoot some of his stuff. But uh, I know he'd probably appreciate it if I showed up next time with my iPhone. But they they are they're incredible. I mean, they really, really are. And and uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say that there were times that I've delivered images, maybe not an entire shoot, but an image or two to a client that, uh, you know, you can shoot with with an iPhone um whatever iPhone you have, I mean, the 12 or whatever, the latest one, um, whatever that latest one is, I mean, they, they do such phenomenal things and the, the technology that they're talking about coming out with, with, you know, more zoom and optical zoom and all these things, it's, it really is crazy. Um, if you're not doing production level stuff, uh, it, it, it's, it's almost as good as you can get. And I think it's important. We've been talking equipment, we've been talking cameras. Um, but the reality is, you know, you look at some of the great artists in the world, they use paint brushes and I can buy paint brushes too. Uh, there are skill, there's skill involved here. And I think that's that's what separates people like you from someone like me or anyone else. Um, it, there's skill and there, there's a lot of, of work and, and effort and experience that go into to being an artist with this stuff. What are some things that kind of you can think of that, that some of our, our viewers and, and listeners that go out on these boats and maybe they're shooting with the with the cell phone camera, or maybe they're shooting with something better. Um, what are some things that you can kind of think of off the top that they should be thinking about as far as tips when they go out? Yeah, I mean, I, I try to place myself into that, you know, into that realm um, before I get there. Um, are you going out on a charter where you just want to come home with your limit of fish? Are you out with something in mind like, hey, I, I really want to catch a big fish? Are you there because um, you just want to enjoy the day and you you want to take in all of the different stuff? Some of my favorite fishing photos that I've ever taken um, didn't have a whole fish in it, didn't have a fish in it for that matter. Um, but finding the things around you that kind of define the story of the experience, um, 
you know, for, for the, for the boat captains that go out, that's their job. And they, they are going out and they're taking clients out and they want to put them on fish and provide that experience. But there's a lot of other stuff. If you are sitting in the chair or got the rod in your hand that are really a pretty cool part of that, um, of that experience. So I think one of the first things that I would tell folks is, um, try to notice and and take photos of some of those things that you find unique and beautiful and um, artistic along the way. Obviously, you're going to have some sunrises and sunsets and you're going to see wildlife or you're going to see stuff that, that might be worth snapping a photo of. But um, have you ever really looked at, you know, at close up at, at the, the reel you're using or the rod or how the... Um, how the bait sits on the water, or trying to find some of those just kind of cool um, abstract things, I think is kind of a, a fun thing to shoot as well. Um, you know, the obvious shot is the is the hero shot. It's the grip and grin with the the catch of the day or whatever. And, and I'm sure we'll talk, um, you know, we'll talk through a lot of that as well. But whether you have a cell phone or whether you have a high end, uh, you know, commercial level camera or whatever, I'm trying to just tell the story of what happened during that day um, from the time the boat went in the water till the time it came out and all of the things in between, you know, having photos that kind of tell that story, I think is one of the things as an artist that I'm always trying to think about. Yeah, that's, that's actually a really good point and something that, that I'd really like to hear your perspective on, you know, since the, the dawn of time, we've been, we've been painting murals in caves and things like that. Why is it important to even do this? Why is it important to, to preserve this by a photograph or however we want to preserve it? Why, why is photography important in, in this realm? It's a great question. And, it, and like you said, um, you know, for thousands of years, people have been painting pictures of their, of their quarry on the inside of the caves and telling stories through, through these old photographs or or paintings for that matter. Uh, I was just looking through, I love looking at like the the old time photos. Uh, I was looking at some just yesterday of some deer hunters um, from, from the late forties and they're all just wearing all red. And it seemed like the deer were just so much bigger and they're all laying there. And it's just these, you know, this proud moment of, of this interaction between, you know, hunter gatherer and, and the quarry and being thankful for uh, you know, for being provided that experience and ultimately, you know, that food for, for the table. Um, so documenting that is something that I think is really, really important. And um, to do it, to do it is important. And in my case, I'm always critical of it, but to do it well and to do it in a way that's honorable to the, to the sport, but even more so, and more importantly, maybe honorable to the to the fish or to the deer or to the, whatever the, the animal was that you're going to, you know, take its life and take it home to, to consume it and feed your family. So being, you know, flattering and honoring that way is important too. Starting to get a few questions. Here's one from Facebook and Larry would like to know uh, what do you use to protect your camera in bad weather? That's a good question, Larry. Um, <laughs> I could probably sit and tell a lot of stories of cameras that uh, didn't, didn't turn out so well that have, gone into rivers or into lakes, it's happened. Um, again, it's, it's, it's kind of one of those tool things. Um, I, I will use, um, you know, some of the, the, uh, they, they make housings and stuff that you can put over your, over the camera body and right up to the end of the lens that will basically expose the lens and then let the, you know, you put your hands up inside it. Um, that, that's a pretty valuable thing. And obviously you can order stuff to, specific to your camera, but ultimately you can, you know, you can use a, a garbage bag or a Ziploc bag um, just as well. So stuff like that. Um, this EOS, uh, the R system that I was talking about is, is weather sealed. It's not, it's not waterproof, but it's weather sealed. Um, I was shooting the other night uh, in a cornfield and there was an irrigator and I guess part of it, I had to, I had to get wet to get the shot that I wanted. My son was watching and he's like, dad, you know, how can you do that to your camera? And, you know, for it to get a little bit wet is okay, but to spend a whole day out in the rain um, or the snow or whatever, um, you do want to take care of it. So obviously I, I, I do the best, but you know, anywhere from a, from the inside of your jacket to a Ziploc bag, to some of the you know, camera specific things that they make that, uh, that, that cover up the whole body, except for, 
you know, the element on the lens. Um, so somewhere in between there. Um, and then having those things, you know, planning in advance enough to know that I'm going to need that at some point and having it available is important too. Good All question. Right, uh, you, you and I have uh, been on a few shoots together out on the ice and a lot of moving and roaming around and with great lakes fishing, you're not going to do that. You're in a boat. There's, there's tight quarters there. How would you manage that as a photographer to get everything you want as far as being able to get maybe some of those wider shots and, and not really being able to get away or, you know, you can't step 30 feet off the boat and shoot back. How, how, how do you manage that? That's a really good question. Um, and, you know, that question, I guess, would be more directed towards me as a professional that's there trying to, you know, get work done versus somebody that's on the boat fishing, um, you know, just to fish and maybe take some photos along the way. But I, whether I'm on a boat or on a lake or on the ground, I'm, I'm one that's, I'm always trying to um, get my camera to a unique perspective. Um, we as humans walk around all day at you know, between five and six and a half feet off the ground or whatever. And that's the the view that our eyes are trained to see. So I, um, I love to climb up on stuff. I love to lay down on things. I love to lean out over stuff, get my camera to different places um, is, is something that I do. I encourage other people that are into trying to be a little more artistic to, to do the same. Um, that's not always feasible to say, hey, I'm going to, you know, climb up on top of the on top of the boat or I'm going to lay down on the deck and I guess that kind of goes back a little bit to Larry's question too is like you know protecting your camera body too if you're holding it out over the you know over the water um, in the spray of the wake or any of those things but I, I try to get to unique places in in my situation um, the other thing that I am constantly juggling and thinking about you know I'll always have two camera bodies on me and it's thinking about my lens choice. Um, you mentioned it like, a, you know, having one wide angle and then one, you know, one lens that's going to shoot a little tighter where you can literally, without having to stop and switch lenses and everything, I can see something that I, where I'm going to, I'm going to capture something big and wide that's going to tell part of the story. But with a quick switch, I can punch in, get in, you know, really intimately close to something else. So those are things that I'm constantly juggling and, and, more than juggling, I think um, anticipating. Uh, that's one thing that I always tell young photographers is like, be thinking one step ahead of with, you know, everything that's going on. Because if you are truly reactionary as a photographer, you're going to miss most of the shots that you could have gotten. Yeah, I think that's uh, a couple points there. One, one I was always taught as a student was to, to shoot ordinary things in unique ways or ordinary mm -hmm. things in an extraordinary way. Um, but I like what you said there. You're talking about uh, um, kind of thinking ahead and, and thinking about that next shot before you take it. Um, how do you think that you would do that on, on a Great Lakes fishing trip? What are some things that, that you would be anticipating when you're out there? And what should, should people kind of be thinking about as they're out there? Right. I, you know, what I would do if I were, you know, on a boat on an assignment is – take a look at like, you know, what does the boat look like? Where am I going to be able to, you know, where am I going to be able to get to? Where are people going to be fishing? Where are rods going to be? Where are lines going to be going out? Where's the captain going to be? How much movement is going to be happening between all of those people? Where, you know, what accessibility do I have? Um, or am I going to be stuck somewhere? You don't want to, you know, get in the way of what's going on, um, the process of fishing. But at the same time, you do want to get you know, get the shots. And I think part of that too is communicating with the captain or the other people on the boat. Like, Hey, you know, at some point, if you hook a fish, do you mind if I come in to right here to, to get a photo or to shoot some video? I'm um, having those conversations in advance. Um, knowing, you know, what are, what's the water condition going to be like, are we going to be bouncing all over the place? Um, are we going to be, is it going to be dead calm? Is there going to be wind? Is there, you know, looking at the weather and, you know, what is the sun going to be doing? And, thinking of a handful of times that I've shot, um, you know, in Alaska out on boats where there's been days where there's been 15 to 20 foot seas and you are wanting to throw up and you can't hold anything still and people are miserable, but there's been other days in the, you know, in the same area um, where it's been dead calm glass and you're dealing with just bright hot sun and 
So trying to anticipate some of those things in advance um, are things that I would think about as a as a uh, as a storyteller, as somebody that's that's trying to capture um, you know the event. If I were on the boat fishing and I was thinking about some of these things, um, what do I like all the way back to like what do I want to get pictures of to tell this story? But like, what if we do get a giant? Um, you know, I mean, if you're watching this, you probably know that feeling of okay, we've got this huge fish on and then the fish comes in the boat and it's it's usually chaos, you know? And I'm trying to think through a little bit about like, am I gonna be ready to take a picture that's gonna do this thing justice, um, you know, before it's flopping around in the boat or we're trying to get a handle on it or all of the things that happen. So again, trying to anticipate some of those things in advance. Uh, yeah, that's something that, that you do. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been on shoots with you for fishing and that's something that, that you know, we talk about getting shots of maybe setting out gear, the boat or the people or whatever. And and we can kind of coach those people or we can kind of plan those things. But when when the fish comes up the hole, and in our case, oftentimes when you and I have worked together, but when that fish comes into the boat, um, we don't have an infinite amount of time usually. Tell us about kind of some of the things that you do to kind of make, make that fish look better um, and, and be able to capture that while while the fish is in the boat. Right. And, and I just, I think thinking of these things in advance and I, you know, I appreciate you having me on because I, I hope that some of these things, um, you know, will plant a seed with, with the, the guys and gals who are listening in or watching, um, you know, regardless of the camera you're using or the species of fish that you, you know, you're catching or fishing for, um, you want to, for the sake of the picture, keep the fish alive, if you will. I, I know, you know, on the Great Lakes, you and I were talking, I mean, people are bringing these fish home and they're going to get cut up and they're going to get eaten and it doesn't really matter. You're not, uh, you're not on some exclusive trout stream in Montana trying to keep the fish wet and all of those things. But at the same time, for the sake of the photo, um, the, the quicker you can get the photos done, the better the fish looks. Um, you can probably look at fish photos where you can see that the fish looks pretty dead and those aren't flattering and they don't do the fish, you know, much justice. And honestly, they don't do fishing as an industry or fishermen or fisherwomen um, much justice either because people look at it and are really turned off. So you want, you want the fish to look good. Um, it's the, it's the co-star of the show, if you will. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I really encourage people with right away is like, consider what's going on in your background. And if that means, you got to move somebody out of the background that's standing in the way, or you need to move the person with the fish or move yourself as a photographer so that um, things are lined up better so that your background um, is not distracting. That's, um, that's also important, something to, to keep in mind. Um, thinking about your lighting, you know, are you, is it, is it early morning? Is it late evening? Is it, is the sun overhead? Um, what are sun and shadows doing? Um, a lot of times, if it is a sunny day and you're in a boat, you probably got sunglasses on. Does the person want to have the sunglasses on or off? Um, if they are off, do you probably don't want them staring or squinting into the sun. So things to kind of consider. And again, a lot of those things happen on the fly because you're not going to, you know, have the captain turn the boat around or move at this or can you, you know, just you got to deal with it as it happens. But um, so considering the light and then, you know, the 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 tip that I, you know, I would give everybody obviously does the the long arm thing where it's like, hold it out farther. And you've seen some of those that are just so obnoxiously um, far out. Um, they, they become kind of comical. So there's a little element of that where you want to hold it towards the camera, but not too much. More important than that is to, if you can get the camera slightly lower than the fish. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's not an angle that if you're shooting uh, female models don't like to be shot low angle much, but if you're shooting fish, um, that's probably something that's going to help that fish look a little bit bigger is just to get it a little bit lower than the, uh, than the level of the fish, instead of shooting down on it, shoot up just a little bit. Um, and that'll help, uh, that'll help a little bit with, uh, you know, making that fish look good. Um, as far as other things, the actual hold on the fish is, is so important. Um, how you hold it. Um, I know a lot of the folks that are watching are, are catching salmon and they're catching, you know, longer fish, if you will. Um, 
getting getting a hold on that gill plate is important. Uh, a confident hold, but not one where you're just horsing the thing around and you know ripping its head off. So a, a confident hold on the gill plate, and then you know what you're doing with that other hand if it's big enough and you can grab onto you know grab onto the tail or you know get your hand underneath it. it all depending on how you want to do that. But that that gill plate hold is really the the confident one. Um, with longer fish, if you can, you know, get that other hand down there a little farther and, you know, let the midsection almost sink a little bit. It always makes those fish just look a little bit bigger. Um, I can think of some big pike photos that I've taken where the thing is just, you know, a musky photo or it's just this, it's just a slob of a fish just hanging there. And that I always kind of like that look. Um, Again, you've got the this shot where everybody holds the fish out, but you know, try some different things. Try you know, changing the angle, putting the head of the fish a little bit towards the camera. Um, whoever's taking the photo, just let them like take photos and move the fish around, and just you know, changing angles a little bit. Um, you know, with salmon, um, I think about again. I, I haven't fished them much on the Great Lakes. I fished them a lot in Alaska. Changing the angle of that fish um, as you as you kind of rotate it back and forth. Um, how the light hits it, there's times that it looks bright white. And then as you change that angle a little bit, you get that kind of that silvery glow that you want. So those are a lot of things that, you know, are little tricks that as I work with fishermen or people with them that you coach them through as a photographer, Hey, rotate it a little more, you know, lower the head just a little out towards me a little bit more, um, tilt it a little bit towards me, you know, coaching them because, People are going to just pick the fish up and hold it out and call it good. Um, <clears throat> so those are all, I, I guess, things to think about. Um, I personally, I know a lot of people will do the the vertical hold and just let the fish hang. And I think there's probably one of those that's that's good. But I, I'm more partial to kind of the horizontal fish shot. But, you know, that's just me. Um, the other part of it is that other hand that's not in the gill plate. Like, do everything you can to not just, like, grab onto that body of that. If you can get, I've got, I've got big meat cleaver hands. So I'm always conscious of like, get your hands under or behind the fish as much as possible so that, you know, that's going to make it look a little better. And it's, again, it's flattering to the fish. If you can get your big meat hooks out of the way. Yeah. I think another thing, and you kind of touched on it and uh, you, you did, I think, I think you've answered both Rick's question uh, asking about kind of moving that around and then uh ryan also you know you see that that this picture all the time mm -hmm. um kind of hoping hoping to see that thing die yeah. but uh i think one of the things that that i see a lot and i think is really cool you know we always think of the the person and then and then the fish in front of them but i've seen a lot of guys kind of like you said kind of turn it to the side and get a different type of background you get that sky in the background or you know a lot of these guys are fishing out of ports where it's busy and, and you'll see other boats and mm -hmm. things like that in the background and and really that's partly your job as a photographer you can have that person holding the fish and you can move you know if you move 90 degrees you're you're, you're changing the background by 90 degrees too so you know not having the person have to move around a lot with the fish is, is a great thing um, and again, like I said, kind of, you know, coaching them through the, the, the tilting, the, you know, a little bit, you know, head lower, you know, tail lower, whatever it might be, coaching them through that because we've all stood there holding a fish and you're not real sure what the photo is going to look like. And um, so as a photographer, as a, another person in the boat who you got handed a cell phone, um, coach them through those things a little bit and, and, you know, take a bunch of them, take a bunch of photos. Um, and, and kind of see see what you end up with. Um, you, you want one that, that works. I think back, I've got the picture on, on my mantle. Um, I caught a 56-pound king salmon on the Kenai River a long time ago. It was not, it was before the days of digital. And um, I'm really thankful that the, the guy that I threw the camera to to take the photo took a whole bunch of photos because all of them except one photo the fish was cut off. My head was cut off. The, it, it was just chopped up. I mean, he was all over the place. And of all those photos of that of that giant king, um, I got one photo where all of me, or you know, all of my head and all of the fish was in it. And you know, that was a giant fish in a in a pretty small river boat. So it wasn't like we had all the space in the world to work with. But 
take a lot of photos, especially if you're on the Great Lakes and you're, you know, you're bouncing around, um, get a, get a bunch of them and, you know, do what you can to, to kind of coach them the best that you can, but, um, err on the side of taking too many. Hey, you just brought up bouncing around. And one thing that we haven't talked about, we've talked about a lot of different equipment thing, but support. So what are you using to, what would you use if you were out in a boat, like a girl boat doing some fishing as far as holding that camera and, and trying to keep your gear steady and try to keep everything. What are you using there? Yeah. Um, get your sea legs under you, I guess the best that you can. And, uh, it, it's tricky with being in boats that are bouncing around because you know, there's really nothing to, I mean, you can lean against, uh, you know, against a motor or against a, you know, if there's a, a cabin, um, you can lean against those things, but everything is literally moving. So, um, again, I haven't done a lot of great lakes fishing. I've done a lot in Alaska and I'm thinking about, you know, keeping a wide stance with my feet and making sure that they are solid and, um, you know, just find, if you can find something for your upper body to lean against, that's great. Um, as far as camera technique, um, you know, pulling your elbows in against your body and getting the camera in as close to yourself as possible. It's one of the nice things about a lot of these mirrorless cameras now, you know, with the viewfinder, um, you can hold it and look down at the camera body without having to have it up to your eye, um, which is great. But, you know, having a, having a good base for your, your feet and legs and then having your, you know, your upper, your upper arms and elbows pulled in against your body is, is a lot of times all you've got to work with. Al Blom's got a question, and I, I like it. Uh, when you have multiple fish, it's the best to place uh, smallest to biggest, vice versa. Do you mix them up? Uh, what's your kind of call there? And I, we've all seen the photo back at the dock with the fish all hanging there. How would you go about setting that shot up? That's that's a good question, man. I you see a lot of those, and especially for you know, for guys that are going out on charters and stuff where you're going to come in with a whole pile of fish. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think um, probably the, the biggest to smallest is probably the way to do it. If you, um, if you truly want to distort that a little bit, you could, the angle that you shoot it, if you're not shooting perfectly parallel to the way the fish are hanging or sitting, move yourself a little bit to the larger side and shoot that way. It's going to make the bigger fish look a little bigger and the smaller fish look a little smaller. So there's tricks that you, you know, things that you can do there. Um, I think just trying to have some sort of method to the madness, I guess, is nice where there, there's some things that just look nice instead of just randomly, you know, hanging fish or laying them all out somewhere. Um, you know, the, the, the pile of fish, again, it's one of those things that, you know, as an industry and, as sportsmen, um, that doesn't project real well to people that don't fish or hunt or spend time in the outdoors. If they see, we've been very conscious of it. I know you and I, um, the, one of the last shoots we were on, we were, we got into some perch and we were catching perch like over and over and over. And they're truly, they're truly were piles of fish. I mean, everybody got to take home, everybody caught fish, everybody got to take home fish. And I know of all these captains that are watching, um, that's their goal. Let's take home a bunch of fish, but uh, presenting it in such a way that looks good. That day um, on the ice, I was really, really conscious of, we don't want any images that show up that are a pile of fish laying on the ice or a pile of fish in a bucket or things like that. So if you're going to present, um, you know, the, the volume and the number of fish that you caught, um, I, I think having a little bit of organization to it helps and says a lot, I guess, for uh, for the fishing industry. We've been talking a lot about hero shots and holding <laughs> that fish and how to hold it. Some of the coolest stuff that I'm seeing, though, out there on Instagram right now is just close-up shots of parts of the fish and, and, and capturing all those little things that, and you had talked about earlier, is just kind of capturing the essence. But mm -hmm. I think just capturing the essence of that particular fish, um, you know, they all have a little bit different look to them. And, and lake trout, I think, are just some of the coolest looking mm -hmm. fish because they it's, it seems like they look different whatever lake you catch them out of. But salmon, the same thing. Um, what are some kind of tips as far as getting those close-up shots on the boat? Um, that's something that in my mind, and I probably am saying it under my breath to myself on any assignment that I'm on, I'm saying, um, parts and pieces. I'm always like in my mind, parts and pieces. Don't forget parts and pieces. 
uh, meaning you can shoot the big stuff and tell the story or shoot the hero shot or shoot all of the things that are probably going to tell the story, but thinking parts and pieces where it is the, the pattern of the scales on the fish. It is the, um, in fact, I just um, sent an image today to a client, a, uh, an image, a fishing image that I had taken um, that was just the dorsal fin of a walleye. And it was just kind of this artistic piece that was cut at an angle. And it was the, you know, it was kind of the spikes of that fin and just this really cool bluish green color with nothing behind it. It was just very artistic looking. Um, finding that kind of stuff, finding the little details of the of the species that you're fishing. Um, it, it could be the fish, it could be the it could be the reel, it could be the you know the uh, the eyelets or the pattern on the on the rod or you know, the, the captain's hand on the throttle, or there, there's so many little, again, parts and pieces that kind of help to tell that story and help to tell um, the details of the things that you noticed and the things that maybe some people didn't notice that would in turn appreciate um, after the fact. I think that's, that's a great way to, to kind of put it. We've been talking a lot about equipment and all these different things, but mm -hmm. I think really thinking about when you're out there just telling the story of the trip is really what it comes down to. And again, I, we go back to that cave thing. That's what they were doing is telling yeah. the story. And I think that's probably probably the best advice for people. I did, a, in fact, I, I was just working on a, uh, a portfolio piece here the last few days and going through, I mean, tons and tons of hero image shots and big fish. And one of my favorite images that's going into this book is of our, of our mutual friend, Joel Nelson. Um, and it was an ice shot of a crappie. And it's like, you know, you've seen one, 12 inch crappie, you've seen them all kind of, but he, he held it out and it had the bait in its mouth. And uh, it was just, it was the close up of the texture of the side of the crappie's face and it, you know, the bait. And it was kind of this macro shot. Joel was off in the background. You could tell there was the fisherman was there, but um, it, it was not at all a hero shot, but there was something artistic and something that, that showed the, just that paper thin, delicate nature of the crappie's mouth with the bait and the texture of the, you know, the spots, the, the, the silver and black spots. It was a shot that kind of that parts and pieces shot that I was talking about. Yeah. I would say Joel and a macro shot is probably the best way to shoot him. You know, just him of, he out can be blurry in the background and that, that's probably the best approach for shooting Joel. But that was one other thing I was going to mention with, with regard to shooting the hero shot though, is if you do have a camera that, you know, where you're shooting with fast glass, you, you've got something like what I'm using, Thinking about f-stops, and I know this is kind of nerding out camera-wise on some some of the listeners and watchers, but um, I'm always thinking also about how much depth of field do I need? And you can imagine somebody holding a fish out in front of them. Do you want the fish in focus and the, the fisherman out of focus? Um, a lot of times you want them both in focus. And so making a quick change to change your f-stop so that you get both of them in focus um, is an important thing. Um, it, it becomes instantly artistic if the fish is in focus and the fisherman is not, but that's probably not the shot that that person is gonna want to put in a frame to tell the story of this great fish that I caught that one day. And it's like, oh, I don't even know if that's you because I can't tell, I can only see the fish. So one other little detail to think about. Yeah, and that's something that, you know, like the, the camera that I have, it, it's got three lenses and uh, let's see there, here you go. I mean, you can do some of that, uh, but I think it's also when you have that at your disposal, sometimes it ends up getting overused or the technology, sometimes the, the shot looks a little bit weird. How do you kind of manage that, you know, for these guys out there shooting with, with the cell phone? Yeah, you know, the cell phone thing and everybody loves the portrait mode on the iPhone and how artistic that makes things look. And basically that's um, imitating the, you know, what I would shoot with, uh, you know, with a, with a really fast piece of glass. Uh, in fact, the webcam I've got set up right now has got a, you know, it's a 1.4, you know, depth of field. So the wall behind me is, is 18 inches behind me, but it's out of focus. That's kind of what portrait mode on your cell phone, on your iPhone or whatever is, is trying to imitate. And it looks cool. It's artistic. Um, but at the same time, if there's anything in that background that's out of focus that needs to be in focus to tell the story, then all of a sudden the photo you know, is kind of a failure. So keep those things in mind, um, you know, when you're, depending on which part of the story you're trying to tell, uh, that's that's something 
that you definitely want to consider. Well, Matt, it was great talking to you tonight. Is there something that, that you kind of had on your list of something you wanted to bring up that I haven't asked you about tonight? No, I, I think, um, you know, I, I had written down a few notes and like, like usual, you never really get to all of them or, you know, uh, but the, the, um, I guess the one thing that I would try to leave folks with is two things. One, and we've talked about both of them, but anticipate things. Think about, you know, if you truly want to come away from, maybe it's your charter trip that you go out and this is a once in a lifetime trip for you. Um, think in advance, like, yeah, I want to catch fish and I want to have this great experience, but think about what do you want to come away with for images? I mean, what do you, you know, yeah, I want the great big fish. That's great. But are there other things along the way that you, um, can take photos of that will be great memories, maybe something that's artistic, something that's cool in addition to the kind of the hero grip and grin shot or the shot, um, you know, like like Al was asking with the multiple shots at the end. Those are the obvious ones that, that everybody's gonna want, but are there other things that you can anticipate in advance and try to uh, be ready to take if the opportunity presents itself? And then the other, the other thing is like the cell phone is is the best camera in the world because it's probably on your person 99% of the time. And you're literally like one click away from being ready and able and willing to take a photo. So all the biggest, baddest cameras in the world with the biggest lenses and the most money spent, those are all great and I will use them, but the, the most valuable camera that you can have is the one that's with you and, and uh, don't forget about it. Take advantage of telling those stories. You know, I, I just uh, remembered something I wanted to ask you about uh, that I haven't yet, but you also use a drone, and, and a drone is something that can really come in handy. We talked about not being able to get off the boat. Well, that can get you off the boat. Um, what are some kind of drone tips that you would offer to people if they wanted to get into shooting their, their boat out on the Great Lakes with a drone? That's a that's a great and tricky question. Um, I... I know we had uh, somebody had asked earlier about um, insurance on cameras and yes, I do have insurance on, on my gear. And thankfully I did last summer because uh, I, I had a, a little drone accident. That's one tricky thing about dr drones are awesome. They give you a wonderful perspective on things. It's a, it's a unique perspective. It's amazing. The technology they've got, the things that they can do. Um, all of that being said, drones and boats are super tricky because um, when it comes down to it, they're going to need a place to land. Yes, you can land them in your hand and you can grab them, which, you know, sometimes you have to, and it can be a little sketchy with rotors going and stuff like that. And that might be the, sometimes the best option in a boat, but, um, having a plan before you take off with that drone out of a boat, you better have a plan to land it and where it's going to land, whether that be, I'm going to shoot the boat where we're at. And I'm going to fly over and I'm going to land it, you know, on land over there, or I'm going to have a spot in the boat where I know we can bring that thing down safely, or I'm going to, you know, catch it in my hand. Um, my story last year was, was a two day shoot, two days worth of just epic content on this drone. And we were, we were up on a, right on the Canadian border, um, shooting some walleye stuff. And there was this just awesome storm coming in and the winds were just starting to pick up and it was this super just moody, edgy. I was just like, it was awesome. It was like the, some of the coolest footage and, and photos that I had taken probably all year. And the boat was starting to rock. We were in a, you know, probably a, a 19 foot with like a 200 outboard on it. And there was a big, you know, deck on the back um, where we had the seats folded down. I thought I'm just going to land it there. Well, when that thing comes in, <clears throat> so the battery's also dying, so I'm getting the, the warning, bring it in. And as I came in to land it on that deck, you know, the boat is bouncing around. Well, the drones doesn't know that. And um, it goes into landing mode. And once it goes into that, like the controls are off. And so it started, you know, the last four feet or whatever was going to land in this deck. Well, the, the boat kept moving <clears throat> and the, the one rotor caught the cowling on the on the motor and it hit the water and all of those rotors were still going when it hit the water and it sucked it in like a whirlpool. And like, I, I knew it was going in and I reached and it was, it was gone in a split second, um, 45.2 feet down. So that's, I know exactly where it is. And I'm, I've actually got a guy that's a, 
a diver that might might go try a recovery uh, mission on it this summer, which would be a story of all stories if I could get that back, at least to get the SD card back to uh, to tell the story. So that's my absolute, you know, have to know what you're doing when uh, that thing comes into land is the most important thing with the drone. Well, Matt, again, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, your your passion for this kind of comes through as you're talking about it. So it's fun to see you and, and kind of get an idea of what, what this means to you. Uh, if people want to see some of your work and kind of see what you're up to, what's the best place for them to go? You know, for all of us now in the creator business, it's probably Instagram. Um, <clears throat> my Instagram is just at Matt Addington, um, which is an easy place to probably find me. And, and uh, mattaddington.com is my website. Um, you can certainly email me through there or message me, um, you know, on Instagram or whatever, Facebook, I'm on Facebook too. But uh, I know there's there's a, a whole number of questions here that we didn't get to to answer. And if, if people have uh, have more and want to follow up, I'd love to love to answer some more of those. So those would be the places you can probably see most of my stuff. Perfect. Thanks so much, Matt. And uh, Al Blom, uh, since Matt liked your question, we're going to give you uh, the question of the night. So you can go ahead and send us a direct message on Facebook and we'll get that swag package out to you. So Matt Addington, really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, it was fun to have you and uh, good luck as you get out there the rest of the year and uh, probably see you during ice season. Likewise, Chris, look forward to it.